The Peter Principle and the Keys to the Kingdom. What is the Peter Principle? The Peter Principle is a key that unlocks many a parable. It is, in fact, the key to understanding the church and its history. Jesus himself establishes this principle in Matthew 16, 18, and 19, when he says, And I say also to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to you, and whatever you bind on the earth shall be, having been bound in the heavens, and whatever you loose on the earth shall be, having been loosed in the heavens. These words have often been misunderstood as meaning that the church must be able to trace its apostolic lineage through Peter. Apostolic succession is not what is meant by these verses. When we go back to the original reason why Jesus calls Simon a rock, it is because he listened to his Father in heaven, verse 17. So it is this listening to the Father that is the rock, and consequently it is this listening to the Father that is the foundation of the church. So the church is not founded on the basis of apostolic succession, nor Peter, but rather on listening to the Father. And just as Peter is given the keys of the kingdom by listening, so the church after him. The church and Peter are synonyms in the language of parables. When we see the name Peter in a parable, we are to substitute the word church. As you might imagine, once you get started, you will be able to discern other keys as well, until you come to understand the mystery of the key. I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. A good place to start is with Peter's three denials of Jesus. In John 1, 1 through 5, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was toward God, and God was the Word. This one was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him came into being not even one thing that came into being. In him was life, and this life was the light of men. And the light is shining in the darkness, and darkness did not overtake it. And in verse 14 we read, And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So we know in parabolic language, Jesus is the word. When we apply these rules to Peter's denials of Jesus, the parabolic meaning becomes the church will have denied the word three times before the return of Christ. Mark 14, 53-72 gives an interesting account of these denials. And they led Jesus, the word, away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all of the chief priests and the elders and the canon lawyers, and Peter, the church, followed him at a distance, even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witnesses against Jesus, the word, to put him, it, to death, and found none. For many bear false witness against him, it, but their witness agreed not together i.e. the basis for rejecting certain books was unfounded and deliberately trumped up. And there arose certain and bare false witness against him, it, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, the natural church, and within three days, i.e. in the third millennium, I will build another made without hands, i.e. the undefiled church. But neither so did their witness agree together, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, the word, saying, Answereth thou nothing? What, what is it which these witness against thee? But he, the word, held his peace, and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, and saith, What need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy, what think ye? i.e., let's put the word to the test, and see if it really comes to pass. And they all condemned him, the word, to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him, and to cover his face, and to buffet him, and to say unto him, Prophesy! And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. The word was abused, hidden, destroyed, etc. And as Peter, the church, was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest, 
to accuse the church of adhering to the word. And when she saw Peter warming himself, i.e. seeking to be comfortable during a very trying time in church history, she looked upon him and said, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out onto the porch, and the cock crew, meaning this event took place before the first millennium. And a maid saw him again, and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them, i.e. those who adhere to all of God's words. And he denied it again. This was in the 17th century when the Protestants, by consensus, removed the Apocrypha from the canon. Note Matthew 26.72 uses the word oath to describe this particular denial of the word. And a little after, they that stood by again said to Peter, the church, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean. And thy speech agreed thereto. The scriptures that you use will tell the very story of your past and future. And he, the church, began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man, word, of whom you speak. And the second time the cock crew, the year 2000, and Peter, the church, called to mind the word that Jesus, the word, said unto him, Before the cock crowed twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. The church will regret having made such a horrible mistake. This is what actually happened. The church took centuries to finally fix the canon at 66 books that were considered to be authentic, plus an additional 15 books that were still more or less in dispute. Specific dates as to when this decision was actually made are a bit hard to determine, but it is agreed that the issue was settled sometime during the late 4th century. This is why the cock crowed between the first and second denials, because the first denial was destined to occur before A.D. 1000, and two were destined to follow afterward. The second denial was, as previously stated, when the Protestants dropped the disputed books by mutual consensus. The third will be when the church will be confronted with this issue around the year 2000, the second cock crow, the dawn of the third day. The detail about Peter's accent is intriguing because it has to do with the way words are spoken. In other words, the Bible is written in parables and codes. The church, as will be demonstrated later in this treatise, will not admit to this mistake, even though it will be easily demonstrated through the interpretation of parables. Get thee behind me, Satan. Using the same keys as before, the hidden meaning of one of Jesus' strongest rebukes against anyone in the New Testament becomes clear. In Matthew 16, 21 through 23, only a few verses after Jesus identifies Peter as representing the church in parabolic language, he rebukes him sharply. It reads, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he, the word, must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, i.e. be torn and publicly humiliated by canon lawyers who would destroy the word of God, and be raised up on the third day, i.e. the word would be revived in the third millennium. Then Peter, the church, took him, the word, and began to rebuke him, it, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. The fact that Peter denies this will happen to the Word implies that he sees himself as its protector. But he, the Word, turned and said unto Peter, the church, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men, i.e. the things of God would be the scriptures, the things of men would be traditions, theology, buildings, money, social standing, etc., so we see that the formula works again, and it tells the same story. These are the very keys that Jesus told Peter, the church, in verse 19 that he would give. Peter is going to facilitate God's plan by being a hindrance to the truth. Since the church's blindness prevents it from recognizing the mystery, God will be able to reveal it in its season, and thus cast Satan out of the church once and for all at the close of this age of wickedness. Satan hath desired to have you. 
In Luke 22, 31 through 35, Jesus reveals that Satan will exert a powerful influence over the church. It reads, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you, so that he may sift you as wheat. But I, the word, have prayed for you, that thy faith fail not, i.e. that his words will be understood at their proper time. And when thou, the churches, art converted, i.e. when you accept the apocryphal books along with the keys, strengthen thy brethren. Use your resources and power to restore the body of Christ to its glorious state. And he, Peter, said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Without realizing it, Peter is acknowledging that he will fall under the influence of Satan, prison and death. And he, the word, said, I tell thee, Peter, I prophesy to you, church, the cock shall not crow this day before thou deniest that thou knowest me. You will deny the word once before the year one thousand. Again, we find the same pattern at work here. What you are picking up on is the story behind the story, the parabolic meaning. Jesus is asking the church to convert to the faith that will not fail. This will not happen right away, since we know the third denial will take place right at the second cock crow around A.D. 2000. But we shall see that the church will indeed be converted and repent of its error. Wherefore didst thou doubt? Other examples of the Peter principle involve end-time events. Before we can understand the parable of Peter walking on water, we must find some more keys. First of all, water is a synonym for word. We read in Ephesians 5:26 that he, Jesus, might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of the water of the word. We may also translate the word wind as doctrine, because Ephesians 4.14 says, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The waves are false teachers who have infiltrated the church, since Jude 4 says, For there are certain men crept in unawares, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jude 13, referring to these men, says that they are raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. In Matthew 14, 22-23 we read, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship, and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. That is to say that the body of believers would have to venture out into the future without the tangible experience of Jesus' presence along the way, while those who had partaken of the bread, knowing the mystery of the kingdom, would have to remain in the past. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain to pray, and when the evening was come, the church age, he was there alone, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, the infiltrators, for the wind, doctrine, was contrary. The disciples were being held back by false teachings. And in the fourth watch of the night, late evening or early morning, the end of the church age, and the beginning of the millennium, Jesus, the Word, went unto them, walking on the sea, the sea represents the nations of the world, the great age. Psalm 65, 7 illustrates this by saying, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. The fact that he is walking on the sea illustrates his transcendence of human understanding and teaching. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, when they perceived the transcendence of the word over the teachings of men, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, the word that will manifest itself at the close of this age, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi Codices, etc. Be not afraid. And Peter, the church, answered him and said, Lord, if it be you, the word of God, bid me to come unto thee on the water. Allow me to transcend natural understanding, too. And he said, Come. And when Peter came down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, 
the backlash of tradition, he was afraid and beginning to sink into a natural understanding. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they, the church and the word, were come into the ship, the wind, false doctrine, ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Interestingly, in John 6.21 it says, Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went, the kingdom. Jesus, who was the word of God, and the ship, which is their faith, were the only two things capable of transcendence. The church could not by itself have escaped the perils of this age, false doctrine and worldliness. As for the mountain that Jesus was on, this is symbolic of power and authority. He is where his disciples could not follow him, the right hand of the Father. As for his being alone, God is one. This is difficult to understand, but Galatians 3.19 and 20 gives us this insight. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. God is not a trinity, but a unity. His threefold aspect has to do with how he reveals himself in the scriptures. The Old Testament is the testament of the Father. The New Testament is the testament of the Son. And the apocryphal books are the testament of the Holy Spirit. I will attempt to better illustrate this principle later on in this. Peace. Be still. The previous parable had to do with the Word of God entering into our hearts, and this parable will illustrate that the same message is contained in the scriptures we already have. In Mark 4, 35-41 we read, In the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side, let us go on to the kingdom. And when they had sent away the multitude, after all of those who had understood his parables had died, they took him, even as he was, in the ship. The word was put into the Bible without altering it. And there were also with him other little ships. There were other books that would come along. And there arose a great storm of wind, subversive doctrine, and the waves, infiltrators, false teachers, beat into the ship, so that it was now full, full of water, or words from without, that the infiltrators put into the word, such as mistranslations based on false doctrine. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. The word was hidden beneath the surface level of the scriptures, in a dormant state. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind. The sleeping word awoke, and when it did, it had the power to stop all the false doctrines, and said unto the sea, the nations, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm, the millennial kingdom. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? By translating this parable with the same keys as before, we understand that the scriptures that we already go by contain a meaning that is both hidden and dormant, but contains a powerful capacity to silence the enemies of the truth. This is not only for the benefit of the church, but also the rest of the world, the seas. All of our sciences are based on atheistic logic and the method of doubt and the idea of evolution. And when the word of God makes all of these assumptions appear as ridiculous to us as they do to him, we will all be ready to move forward into the Sabbath rest and receive the truth from God, free from traditions. Simon, sleepest thou? The number that is most often associated with Peter is three. We have already considered his three denials of Christ. Let us now explore another example of this phenomenon. In Mark 14, 32-42, we see that the church will be asleep each of the three times it is approached by the word of God. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. 
and he taketh with him Peter, the church, and James and John, which will be explained in a later section, and began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy, because he could foresee that they would all be asleep until the end of the age. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch. And he went forward a little, and fell on the ground, and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him, the word. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. See Isaiah 51, 17 through 23. This is the cup of God's fury, which Jesus had to drink on our behalf, and he is about to give it to our oppressors. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh, and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, the church, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst thou not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. I will have to clarify a few issues here before moving on. There is more here than meets the eye, even if you do understand the parallel between this section and the three denials. As I have previously stated, what we understand is the Trinity is really three stages of God's revelation. The Father corresponds to the Old Testament, the Son to the New Testament, and the Holy Spirit to the Apocryphal books, in that order. We read in John 1.14 that the Word became flesh, and in 1 John 5.7 it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So if Jesus is the Word, and the Word became flesh, then the flesh that Jesus was talking about during the Last Supper was his Word. His Word will be divided, and the blood, his life, see Leviticus 17.14, would go out of his flesh, which is his word, which is the New Testament. But if it was by the shedding of his blood that his life was poured out, it would be by the Spirit that God would raise him from the dead, because Second Corinthians 3, six says, For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. What is going to restore the life to his flesh, the word, is the Holy Spirit. His words will therefore be reunited and his life restored. What words would represent the part of his flesh that was broken off? The words that were removed from the canon are the apocryphal books, so they would be restored through the Holy Spirit, and that is why they can be understood as the testament of the Holy Spirit. See 1 John 5, 6-9. Continuing our narrative, verse 39 reads, And again he went away and prayed, and spake the same words earnestly praying that the church would be vigilant against the wiles of the devil the next time it had to make a decision about the word. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were very heavy. They were spiritually undiscerning. Neither knew they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. The church will have the issue of the word come up a third time, and will still be undiscerning. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me, the word, is at hand. So we understand these events as corresponding to Peter's third denials. And just as Peter rejected Jesus a third time, so he will be undiscerning right up to the end. This situation will create the need for God to call on a different people, the elect. Let us now apply what we know already and see if he hasn't taken pains to reveal more about these people to us. This is my beloved son. Hear him. In Mark 9, 2-13, Jesus reveals his greatness to Peter, James, and John in a most incredible way. It reads, And after six days, six thousand years, Second Peter 3.8, Jesus taketh with him Peter, the church, and James, and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transformed before them, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so no fuller on earth can wipe them. His absolute purity and innocence are indicated here. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus about his departure from Jerusalem. See Luke 9.31.
It will become clear as we move along that Moses represents the Old Testament here, while Jesus represents the New Testament, and Elijah the apocryphal books. Correspondingly, since Peter represents the church, he is the natural counterpart to Jesus, or the New Testament. Moses, therefore, would correspond to the Jews, and Elijah to the elect. We should keep in mind that Jesus referred to John the Baptist as Elijah in Matthew 17:11 through 13 but he also says that he will come and restore all things. There will be, therefore, another person who will function as Elijah, making the way straight for his second coming. Picking up in verse 3, we read, And Peter, the church, answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. That is, let's have separate assemblies, one for the Christians, one for the Jews, and one for the elect. For he knew not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked around about, they saw no man any more save Jesus only with themselves. The fact that Moses and Elijah disappear and only Jesus remains indicates that there are no divisions between these books, but that Jesus, who is the Word, is indeed all three, and therefore transcendent of time and space, since we can plainly see that he would have to be in order to have testified this of himself so far in advance. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. No man will be able to give this interpretation until the word of life rises above the carnal understanding of the scriptures. And they kept saying with themselves, questioning with one another what this rising from the dead should mean. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must come first? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first, and restoreth all things. The one that will restore all things will be Elijah. But what will he restore? John 16, 12, and 13 says, I, Jesus, have many things to say to you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, and he will show you things to come. He will restore the things that Jesus had to say to us that we were not then ready for. He will restore what we rejected. In other words, the Apocrypha. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be said at naught? But I say to you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they wanted, as it is written of him. In other words, if Elijah represents the restoration of the word today, he also represented it then. So by cutting off his head for reproving wickedness in high places, we understand that the scriptures that were cut off then were cut off because he had the power to restore all things to God. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Another place where the number three is associated with Peter is John 21, 15 through 18. This encounter takes place at the Sea of Tiberias, Jesus' third appearance to his disciples after his resurrection. Jesus, the word, saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. By lambs, Jesus is talking about young sheep and hence the early Christians. So this command naturally corresponds to an early period in the church age. This would make a lot of sense if feeding lambs had anything to do with the church not feeding the early Christians the word, or in other words, it corresponds nicely with Peter's first denial. He saith unto him, Peter, or the church, again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, he saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Obviously, if by sheep Jesus was referring to a later period in church history, this would fit in nicely with Peter's second denial by the Protestant churches more than a thousand years later. He saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, 
Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. We should be aware that Peter never volunteered to feed the sheep. The church will not do it, so another entity must arise to do the job. These are the elect ones. Having understood these truths, we can then understand verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou, the church, wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not i.e. the elect will have to show the meaning of the scriptures to these and lead them into the kingdom since to understand any of these mysteries correctly it is necessary to know that the apocryphal books are indeed inspired or else none of this would be understood this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify god the church will be in a dead state in order for the scriptures to be fulfilled since the scriptures turn out to have precisely this meaning and must therefore be fulfilled and when he had spoken this he saith unto him follow me then peter turning about seeth the disciple whom jesus loved following which also leaned on his breast at supper and said lord which is he that betrayeth thee i e john john 13:25 Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? And Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. If tradition can be trusted, and the disciple whom Jesus loved is John, then John represents the body of the elect. Now it can be understood that the real message here is that the elect will tarry till Jesus comes. In other words, they will not be revealed until the time of his second coming, and will therefore be his heralds, functioning as Elijah or John the Baptist. Implications when we interpret Peter as the church and John as the elect, then we can use these keys to unlock other keys. For example, we know that Peter, John, and James were present at Jesus' transfiguration, as well as Moses and Elijah. Since it is evident that Peter corresponds with Jesus and John with Elijah, then James must correspond with Moses, or the Old Testament, which is to say, the Jews. Since James and John are brothers, the sons of Zebedee, it makes sense that in spiritual terms they are brothers as well. It also makes sense that they are called the sons of thunder, Boanerges, Mark 3.17, since both the Old Testament and the Apocrypha are full of fire and brimstone theology. The relationship between Peter and John is particularly intriguing. One can use these insights to unlock the near future. The various interactions between the church and the elect, that is, Peter and John, provide a detailed set of instructions for the end time. Specifically, how the elect are to approach the church with the truth, and how the church is to use its resources to help the elect. For example, in Luke 22, 8-16, Jesus sends Peter and John to prepare the Passover. Jesus foretells that they will encounter a man carrying a pitcher of water, the Word. And also there will be a large upper room already furnished. There will be a higher level of meaning to the scriptures prepared in advance, which verse 16 says will be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. In John chapter 20 verses 3 through 9, we read that Peter and John ran to the empty tomb together. And John beat him there, and saw inside, but did not enter. Whereas when Peter arrived, he entered, and John followed. Therefore we may conclude that the function of the elect is to be the first to see the empty tomb, besides Mary Magdalene, who represents the age. Then allow the church to enter in before them. We must not see ourselves as apart from them, but rather to humbly yield ourselves as servants to the church, so that they may enter in before us, so that we do not prove to be arrogant and unworthy. The book of Acts contains many parables to interpret, such as chapter 3 and much of chapter 4, which I won't detail here except to point out that Peter and John work and heal together, and in complete humility, giving all credit to God. We are to do likewise, performing the same works. 
Another interesting implication of John meaning the elect would be the curious relationship between him and Jesus' mother, Mary. No doubt what I'm about to say will be offensive to some and outrageous to others, but it follows naturally from all of the assumptions previously worked out. Jesus was born of Mary, as everyone knows, and Mary was a virgin, as everyone also knows. How then can we explain Jesus' own statement from the cross in John 20, 26, and 27? Here Jesus is saying that Mary is John's mother, and John is, conversely, Mary's son. It is easy just to chalk this up to the fact that Jesus loved John and could therefore entrust his own mother to his care, but what if we interpret this attribution in a way that is consistent with the foregoing keys? What if John, the elect ones, will also be the result of a virgin birth? In other words, the scriptures, undefiled by any man, are nonetheless pregnant with meaning. Pregnant, that is to say, with a new people, the elect. Another way of saying this is that we are John, and just as the Christians became a new people in the light of the fact that Christ fulfilled the Old Testament and allowed these scriptures to be seen in a new and better light as pointing to Christ, so the Bible will give rise to a new people in these final days. We also shall be born of Mary, that is to say, the Holy Spirit. This idea is known from patristic sources quoting the now lost gospel of the Hebrews and is an idea that is defended by figures no less illustrious than Origen and Jerome. Here is the quote. Just now my mother, the Holy Spirit, took me. Then Jerome goes on to explain that in Hebrew the word for spirit is feminine, so one should not have trouble accepting such a statement. In other words, then, Jesus' mother is Mary, and Jesus' mother is also the Holy Spirit. So using simple, syllogistic reasoning, we may arrive at the same conclusion that those who used to read that lost gospel must have known that when the word Mary is used, it should be understood in the language of parables that the Holy Spirit is what is meant, establishing her function as a key to unlocking parables. Conclusion the key to unlocking the Bible is keys. If you want to become proficient at unlocking the scriptures, you must understand Jesus taught us this very principle in Luke 11:52. Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering ye hindered. Keys were handed down by the apostles and disciples of the early church. The keys were then understood, but only by the initiates they chose. Obviously the mystery was eventually squelched by the lawyers or those who hindered them that were entering. The death of the mystery, and by extension the word, is a paradigm for Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We thus end, as it were, at the beginning. Consider the glorious preamble to John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The secret to decoding this mystery is to be found in the apocryphal Acts of John, which, though known by the early church fathers, was nonetheless rejected by most of them. In chapter 105, Jesus expounds to John the paradoxical nature of his suffering. You, John, the elect, hear that I, Jesus, the Word, suffered, yet I suffered not. That I suffered not, yet I did suffer. That I was pierced, yet I was not wounded. Hanged, and I was not hanged. Blood flowed from me, yet it did not flow. And in a word, those things that they say of me, I did not endure. And the things that they do not say, those I suffered. Now what they are, I will reveal to you, John, the elect ones. For I know that you will understand. Perceive in me the slaying of the word, the piercing of the word, the blood of the word, the wounding of the word, the hanging of the word, the passion of the word, the nailing of the word, the death of the word, and thus I speak, discarding manhood. Therefore, in the first place, think of the word, 
Then you shall perceive the Lord, and thirdly, the man, and what he has suffered. Notice that this does not deny the suffering of Jesus the man, but only relegates it to the lowest of three levels of interpretation. Heretofore, two levels of meaning, those of Jesus the man and Jesus the Lord, have been preached in the churches, and both are correct. But the revelation of another layer of meaning that explains the other two more fully deserves a hearing. If we are bold, we can finish the story. The word was put on trial by those in authority, on trumped up charges just to get rid of it. Even though the word had no defect, and the witnesses against it had no integrity, and their witness against the word was contradictory, and the authorities managed to incite such hostility against the word that the people chose a murderer instead of the one who could give them life. And the word was put to death by means of injustice, violence, and discreditation. The word was then hidden away until through the power of God it was raised up on the third day, the third millennium. These keys will also translate the apocryphal books. If you are willing to put them to the test, you will find that they too decode to the same keys. As a result, investigation should be made of them by those who have the authority to do so. Here we have an objective means of testing for inspiration. If it can be done, then what excuse will we give God for rejecting them a third time? Does the scripture not say that Peter's accent gave him away? The very books that the church currently accepts are that accent. Let us not tempt God. Even so, we know how the story ends. Scripture must be fulfilled.